Um, so hello, everybody. Uh, we're just going to wait um, a few minutes or maybe two more minutes to see um, until all the participants have joined. So just so you know, um, that's why we're all muted. Okay, so I think the number of attendees um, is constant now, more or less. So I'd like to welcome everybody to this coffee chat, to the third coffee chat. Um, I'm just gonna um, share my screen. So my name is Isabella Schalko, and I'm a senior research assistant at ETH Zurich. I'll be moderating today's coffee chat, focusing on picture a scientist. So these IHR coffee chats actually started about a year ago. It's an initiative that is supported by the IHR Gender Task Force. And the idea is to bring together early career scientists and engineers with more established engineers within the IHR community. And the topics focus on various career related topics, but with a special focus on women in engineering. However, these coffee chats are of course open to the entire IHR community and um, even beyond. Um, so today is actually a great occasion for this coffee chat because it's the International Women in Engineering Day. And um, this coffee chat as already said before, um, focuses on the film Picture a Scientist. So a big thank you to IHR for hosting the screening. Um, I hope you were all able to watch this very interesting film during the past two days. Um, I'm very excited to be moderating this discussion and to moderating it with these um, very interesting um, panelists. So we have Astrid Blum, Charlene Gaba, Talila Rudi, and Rafael Tinoco. Um, and I think it'd be great to start off the coffee chat with a brief introduction by the panelists. So Astrid, if you could go first. Sure. Uh, thanks, Isabella. Uh, and also thanks to Elsa for organizing this session. And uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, so my name is Astrid Blum. I'm an associate professor in the Hydraulic Engineering Department of Delft University of Technology. Um, I'm also head of the Rivers and, and Ports group over there. And uh, besides that, I'm a coordinator of, uh, of a master track, the master track hydraulic engineering, which is part of the program in civil engineering. Um, I have included a small resume here, but what is maybe uh, uh, even more interesting than what is listed, uh, what is not listed because I've, um, Adele had to deal with a, a period of long-term illness, which obviously you don't see from a CV, but it does make uh, someone struggle or it can make someone struggle a bit more intense. Um, next, please. Thanks. Um, my overall research objective is um, to increase our understanding of uh, fundamental river processes uh, aimed both at uh, natural rivers, but also engineered rivers. And I've uh, included a print screen of, of two, two um, no, three uh, recent, relatively recent publications 
uh, that I'm most proud of. Um, and they all deal with um, uh, the long-term response of rivers to uh, anthropogenic or, or natural uh, causes of change. Uh, next, please. And then someone, something that I'm even more passionate about, which is uh, outdoors activity. Um, so I love to uh, go and hike, uh, and I also love to go mountain biking in mostly mountainous places, outside of the Netherlands, of course. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, Astrid. Um, Shalene, do you want to uh, continue? Um, Charlene, do you, do you want to uh, continue introducing um, yourself? Sorry. Mm -hmm. So good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Dr. Charlene Kaba. Um, I'm a specialist in climate change and water resources and especially um, hydrological modeling. So I have an interest in um, analyzing the impact of climate change on water resources. So currently I work as a lecturer at the University of Abu Mekalavi at the National Water Institute. And I also do research on water resources management, climate change, and a special focus also on sanitation and hygiene. Yes, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, I guess it's my turn now. Yes, yes, that's great. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Isabella. Thank you, Elsa, for organizing all this. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Dalila Ludi. I am a professor at the Department of Water and Environmental Engineering at the Faculty of Science and Technology, uh, which is part of the University Hassan II of Casablanca in Morocco. Uh, I did my engineering degree uh, a long time ago, I think it's, no, it was in 95, and then uh, I did my PhD, I finished my PhD degree in 2005 in, at Cardiff School of Engineering in the UK uh, in environmental water management. Uh, I was also selected by the Moroccan Ministry of Higher Education as a national contact point for the environment in 2010 to promote the use of uh, the seventh European framework program named FP7. Now it has become uh, what we, uh, Horizon 2020 for research and development. Uh, I'm also a member of the Climate Change Expert Committee of LIDEC, which is a branch of Suez uh, Environment in Morocco. Uh, I was a Fulbright visiting scholar uh, at Stanford University in 2018. Uh, and I was elected uh, as a council member, I'm very proud of, for the MENA and Indian subcontinent region in 2019. Uh, and uh, I was also selected, I participated in a very interesting uh, program called Tech Woman that, is that was launched by the department, the US Department uh, for Educational and Cultural Affairs in 2011. Uh, and I, I invite everyone, every woman who is interested in promoting her career in research to, to have a look at it. Maybe we will get the, uh, an opportunity to talk about this later uh, during our discussion. And uh, of course, I'm very proud to be the president now of the Association of, for Women's Rights in Morocco called the Democratic Association of Moroccan Women. Uh, uh, we will probably have the time also <laughs> to discuss about this later. Uh, my main research interests are about water resource management. I am myself a numerical modeler. Uh, I, lo I love very much uh, playing with all the softwares and programming numerical models for, uh, for, um, uh, for hydrogeology, for uh, 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 water, uh, water and hydraulics in general. And uh, lately, I also focus my research on the water energy nexus uh, because of uh, the very, um, very um, uh, difficult situation that Morocco is uh, living now with uh, water stress. And I think all the MENA region is living now. It's a matter of water security. And I think that we need to focus our national research about this. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Delina. Um, Russell, do you want to um, now introduce sure. yourself? Yeah, first I want to thank you for, for the invitation and the organizers and thank everyone for attending this, this discussion. So yeah, my name is Rafael Tinoco. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I was highlighting other than the institution, rather than the institutions, the places, because I have had the opportunity to live in three different, in three different countries. I'm from Mexico. I did my grad school in upstate New York. Then I went to Santander in Spain, and now I'm back in the, in the US. So I have seen very different flavors of the things that we are gonna discuss later from different cultural perspectives. So hopefully that, that brings a little bit of interesting things for the, for the discussion. Uh, about my research, I work with ecohydraulics. So I, it's all about interactions between hydrodynamics, ecological and geomorphic processes. And I'm mostly an experimentalist. I like my group to be in the lab, finding up new equations, new stuff, new, uh, new interactions between all of these phenomena but we also like to be in the field and try to implement our, our findings on real stuff. Um, also now a member of the, the hydraulics uh, leadership team, and we're trying to work on some of the issues that we're gonna discuss later. I'm also a member of the Inclusion, Diversity, Equality and Access Institute at the College of Engineering at, the, at U of I. And we have been working on some programs to try to increase diversity, to catch kids while they're young so that we can get them again, into the paths of, of STEM and trying to remove those, those leaks from the, from the pipeline. So this is some of the work that hopefully we have a chance to, to talk with you later. And again, thank you for, for joining for this event. Great, uh, thank you very much for this, for introducing yourself. I think that's uh, your CVs and what you've done so far. It's, it's very interesting and I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts on on the film and also on potential actions that IHR could take or, or universities. Um, so the agenda is that now we're just gonna start with an open discussion. So I'm inviting all participants to ask questions using the Q&A box. Um, and then I will read them out loud to, to the panelists. Um, and then depending on the amount of questions, um, some of them may also be answered um, using, typed in instead of um, talking. So, and then we have some, some closing remarks at the end. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Um, and I think we can, uh, I'm just gonna start to kick off the discussion. So I thought the movie was uh, very interesting, um, but what was um, very um, compelling to me or very fascinating was the illustration of this iceberg where they illustrate um, sexual harassment that uh, women or minorities are facing in academia and that the uh, 10% like, above the water level are like uh, unwanted um, sexual attention or coercion or something like that. But the majority is actually the 90% underneath the iceberg related to um, like, uh, emails that are maybe in a, in a tone that's not appropriate or being mistaken by a custodian or something like that. And what was striking to me or what surprised me is that actually when some of these things happen to you, it actually has a similar impact to these like 10% like unwanted sexual um, attention. So this was something that really surprised me during the movie. And so my first question is, did anything actually surprise you watching the movie or, or not? Um, maybe, um, Astra, do you wanna um, start? Uh, thanks, Isabella. Yeah, I, I, I have this uh, same feeling about the movie. The, the, the iceberg very nicely illustrates um, my own observations and in a sense, uh, the movie, I don't think it's a, uh, uh, it has had a surprising effect on me, but in a sense, it's even a sort of relief as it confirms uh, your own observations. Because the 90% underneath the surface is, is way more nuanced uh, than, um, so, so, so typically one has the feeling, oh, something is off. Uh, but you cannot really describe, and when you start to talk about 
it with someone it's difficult to to grasp difficult to discuss so um i it's it i recognize the the observations yes uh yeah i can also confirm the that it did feel a bit like a relief i don't know Dalila, do you want to join her? yeah uh to be honest for me it was really uh very uh, uh there are many things that actually surprised me in that movie and uh, we I, I thank very much ihr for uh, sharing this movie and all the producers of this movie because it's a very powerful way to raise the awareness about the importance of this uh, uh, of these cases. Uh, what's really surprised me is the fact that these cases exist even in uh, the USA. I was thinking maybe we could find this in other countries, uh, developing countries, but the USA that is known uh, as a model for um, its strong constitution uh, based on human rights and equity, uh, who has a long history of fighting against all kinds of discrimination, uh, in addition to its very important place, uh, if it's not the first position worldwide in science and innovation, as a science and innovation leader uh, in the world, um, I wouldn't have thought about this hidden discrimination between men and women, especially in the science field. And what surprised me also is the stigma of uh, family leave. I didn't know about uh, that because I think it's a very normal thing that uh, women can should leave uh, for physical uh, necessity or needs. And um, that, that was the, the, the major point that really attracted my attention in this movie. Uh, for instance, here uh, in Morocco, and I guess all the North African region and even Middle East, uh, uh, North Africa, there is no su such stigma. Of course, we have other kind of discrimination, but uh, for, regarding the stigma of uh, family leave, this is uh, this is quite uh, unusual. Uh, so that's that uh, that was really the the, the point that have uh, triggered me. Thank you. Um, and Rafa, did you did it also surprise you about the, like these incidents in the U.S. or how is it for you since you you're an assistant professor in the U.S. Yeah, it, it surprised me that it didn't surprise me that everything seems so normalized, that everything seems like something like, yeah, I, I could see that happening. So it's it actually scared. That's scary that things seem so normalized that they can happen and no one will do anything. So one thing that stood out is the figure of the ally. So when the, the yeah, when one of the, the people in the in the movie says, I never knew how much it bothered you, you didn't show it to me, so I didn't know. So that really stood out to something that in how many how many times as a man I have that experience, someone that I wasn't really aware of, something in college that was happening and I didn't realize that was bothering someone, uh, something in grad school, something now as a professor. So really, even if it's not surprising that it's not an eye-opening movie to things that we didn't know that they were happening, but they really opened your eyes to think that you weren't really looking, paying, paying attention to. And I think that's one, part of the most important things that this movie can do. Yes, um, I also think that, uh, I think it was Dr. Adam Lewis, the, the, the ally during um, the sexual harassment that Jane, Dr. Jane Wollenbring experienced. And I also found it was stunning to see that, that he was surprised because what she told, it, it seemed so obvious from a, from a viewer perspective. Um, Charlene, was there anything that was surprising to you when watching the movie? Um, Charlene, Gabbard, do you want to also um, share your thoughts on what was surprising during watching the movie? Okay. I'm just going to. Um, chat and ask her afterwards. I'm not sure if, uh, I hope you can all hear me. <laughs> um, yeah. So then I'm just gonna continue reading a question. So there's one question by um, Iona Popescu. Um, so triggered by answers of the three panelists on Isabella's question, I was wondering how much 
in each of the panelists' country do they think their own university looks seriously at this issue and tries to address it? For instance, through imposing percentage to reach in hiring women in academia. Um, I don't know, uh, Rafael, do you wanna go first? Yes, so let me just read it. Could you repeat it, uh, Isabella? Okay, um, so it's about, um, she, she's wondering if uh, in your, your university, do you think that this topic is actually being addressed? So for instance, by having a, imposing a percentage of female being hired? Yeah, so I, again, I can talk about my short experience as a, not that, that short, as, a, as an assistant professor. So there, is, there are special considerations when we are working on a, on a hiring panel when we are working on a, on a committee. So we, we aim to have a diverse pool of applicants and the diverse pools that will be moved into the, into the shortlist when we are working through, through, this, through this process. I don't think there's a fixed percentage that we are trying to, to achieve. I know that there are efforts that there are programs to try to, to increase those, those rates of representation. I don't think it's a, as a goal that we have to hire this type of people for the next cycle. So there's always trying to, to get this diverse group and then the process goes as, as it goes. Uh, in terms of, again, it, it, it's hard to, to mention how it goes in the country. I think it's very institution specific, again, depending on the university, depending on the state even. So it, it's hard to get a, like a general answer, I think, we are people are taking it very seriously whenever there's this type of, of accusation, this type of problems. I think we're raising awareness, but there's still a, a long way to go. But I think that we have seen some some progress, especially since since the past year, that hopefully we don't lose the momentum. Um, Astrid, do you want to maybe add from your university perspective? Yeah, I think I, I think the amount of attention is is growing, um, which of course is is positive, um, but it also has some 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 difficulties. I know that a, a, a young female colleague of mine uh, was recently told by another colleague that she was simply hired for the fact of being female. Um, and, and those are awfully nasty, nasty remarks, besides the fact that it wasn't true. But um, to make such a remark is really uh, belitt belittling and um, humiliating and, and many other things. Uh, another example is, is um, there has been some uh, recent effort to um, uh, initiate the appointment of a diversity officer within our faculty. Which of course, and, and besides that, a diversity team with uh, younger people. Um, but um, at the same time, this diversity officer uh, vacancy was not published uh, in the open. So it was someone from the old boys network uh, being appointed. And uh, it was also someone where, um, uh, well, even, even, even someone in, in this room was offended by. Um, so uh, those are very, although things are seem positive, but they also bring uh, difficulties. Um, but the good thing is that um, the, the awareness seems to uh, become larger. Yes, I, I yeah. agree. Um, Dalila, you, you go first. Yeah, I have. Um, I, I would like to share with you a few figures because uh, the one has asked for the, the, the measures or how much aware uh, our universities are in our countries. Um, to be honest, uh, uh, it was uh, actually the feminist movement in Morocco that has triggered, that has actually uh, attracted the attention of the, the Ministry of Higher Education about the fact that there were no 
women president of university. We have, uh, since our independence from uh, in, uh, in 58, we had uh, around 12 universities in whole Morocco for 33 million population. And uh, we had, uh, during more than 60 years of independence, only one female that was president of the university. And lately, because uh, our fight and we have, uh, we had, we, we made a, a lot of lobbying at the parliament, at, uh, at the media, and we had uh, a result. Now we have two women that are president of university of, out of 12, which is, which is a good thing for so far. Uh, the other thing is that we opposed a few data and I must underline and highlight the importance of dis gender disaggregated data. This is something that is very lacking in many countries, uh, especially like ours. And we are uh, doing, we are uh, lobbying to have uh, disagree, gender disaggregated data for each sector, whether it's in education, health, uh, uh, for uh, all the sectors. And um, for instance, uh, we, we, we are now uh, running a project uh, which is funded by the European Union called Target for promoting uh, gender in innovation and research. Uh, and it's uh, uh, it's uh, the partners are from seven countries uh, from the whole Mediterranean region, from uh, from uh, southern and the northern Mediterranean region, and uh, we we made st some statistics about the genders in uh, uh, and the female uh, positions within universities from these countries, and among my university there were some figures. Let me just. Uh, uh, find it. It's uh, the, the, the women in my university uh, were found to be overrepresented among university graduates. It's it's more than fifty percent. We are we have fifty two percent of uh, female graduates, and they are well also represented in administrative function. It's about forty one percent. However, women women remain underrepresented in top teaching and management position. They account only for 33% of teaching staff uh, at the lowest uh, university position, which is an uh, associate professor here in Morocco. Uh, and what we found is only about 80%, 18% uh, fu uh, become full professor at the end of their career. Uh, so uh, it's there is. Uh, Likewise, uh, an evidence of a problem uh, which is not very visible at the university uh, uh, management level and uh, the, develop the career development of women here in Morocco. And we found that mostly because we associated also social uh, researchers, uh, social science researchers with us in this project to make some questionnaire and find out the reasons why we find this these different figures, especially at the, uh, at the the promotion of the career of women uh, professors and researchers, and we found it was because of the, of course, the cultural aspect, but also uh, the, the difficulty to make a balance between professional and family, uh, fam uh, family, uh, uh, the career and the family. That was the main reasons here in Morocco. I hope uh, I, I I I answered the question. <laughs> Yes, uh, thank you very much. I mean, um, it's very interesting to hear the different initiatives that are ongoing. Um, so I have another um, question. So it also uh, um, has been asked using the Q&A. So in the movie, um, they talk about this implicit bias test, so or uh, implicit association test. And it's also demonstrated with the group, which is uh, very interesting, where you see how it's more difficult to associate women with career and men with like um, household course or something like that. Um, so the question from the audience is um, if your institution has raised awareness that there is this implicit gender bias. So I've heard that for instance, when there are faculty committees, some of the committee members are asked to take this implicit bias test. I'm not sure what happens if um, the result is that you have a your bias. Um, so yeah, have you, um, is that also common in your institution or have you taken the results and was it surprising to you? Something like that. Um, Asa, do you want to start? Sure. I've, I've never seen it used within my faculty. Um, I'm also not surprised by the result. 
Um, and I, I didn't take the test myself, but I'm pretty convinced that uh, the result would be, my result would be similar, which is disappointing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, Ra and uh, Rafa, do you? Oh, don't you know <laughs> no, no, you can go. No, no, it's fine. It's going to talk. Okay. Okay, thank you. I, I, I was just... Uh, I, I tried to take the test, uh, actually, and uh, I did it, and I found that... Uh, uh, the, the, the results said that your data suggests a moderate automatic association between me and woman, and your data suggests a weak automatic association between not me and, and men. <laughs> so uh, uh, so uh, this is, uh, for, for me, it was the first time I've heard about this, uh, this test, and I am glad that I have taken it, and I, I will talk about it uh, around me, but uh, I have to look a little bit more uh, in, 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 or deep, deeper uh, inside the, this questionnaire because uh, I didn't catch all the aspects, especially the social aspects of it. Uh, and uh, for your uh, question about uh, measures uh, at uh, locally for, for gender issues, uh, there is no such tests uh, in my, uh, at, at my university. Uh, I have to say that uh, we have also a language barrier, you know that Morocco has the second language is uh, French and it's difficult to, to take tests like this, although we are trying to, you know, to convert all the system to English language, but it is difficult to, to, to bring people to, to co collaborate and to participate to this kind of tests. But it is a very interesting test uh, and uh, it has many parts. And I think it, it reflects uh, a little bit the state of mind toward uh, gender equity. Yeah, so I can add that we, we do have some bias training when we participate in hiring committees. We have some training when we participate in, in review panels. So th there is some, some advances on that. Uh, the other thing that I want to mention is that, and all Spanish speakers in the room might agree with me, we gender every word. So every word will have a gender in Spanish and many other languages. So yeah, we have that already ingrained in our mind that some words are male, some words are female. That's the way we, we use them. And even if that gets lost in translation, it comes back reflected when we take this type of, of tests. So yeah, that, that's something else that might be not considered when we are thinking just about uh, that type of test in English when there's a whole background behind us that those words that we are translating from Spanish to English, from French to English, from Polish to English, they already have a gender in our mind. So it's already assigned to, to that bucket in the, in the test. And yeah, I, I took the test. It showed that I'm biased towards the same reaction that we are all. So yeah, I, it really made me think about how we associate these words with these categories. Yes, um, thank you very much. Um, so just an information to all the participants, um, Dr. Shaleen Gaba, she has a bit problems with technical issues. So um, until it's fixed, that's why she's, she's currently not joining the discussion, just to you know. Um, thank you. So I'm just going to read another question that has been asked. So um, the person is asking, how could we address subtle discrimination? So for instance, being left out of email lists or titles being omitted in like a research group? Do you, have you experienced something like that or do you have a, some kind of recommendation? Um, Dalila, do you wanna go first? I'm not sure I, I get the question right, but uh, I, the question is about if, the, if I have uh, lived any discrimination situation, is that right? Yes, but more like subtle, like for instance, be left out by email list, like some kind of discrimination where you at first not quite sure, mm, it just kind of feels off, but you can't really put a name on it. Um, and then how maybe how you've reacted to it, um, something like that. Well, uh, to be honest, uh, I didn't feel that much discrimination in my career. I was, uh, I was among the 
less than one third. Uh, we were like 40 women graduated in engineering uh, among uh, more than 120 uh, graduates uh, in 19 back in 1995. But I know that these figures have uh, have improved a lot uh, lately, and we have we are seeing more women uh, graduated from uh, from engineering and science uh, fields. Uh, the discrimination maybe that I uh, I have experienced is. Uh, when uh, when I was applying for a responsibility position, that was really a hard part of it, and uh, uh, and that's what uh, pushed me to go uh, and uh, uh, to, to 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 go toward uh, uh, civil society and uh, fight uh, more in within uh, within a group. Because uh, I shall uh, highlight the fact that uh, a very important message that was. Uh, raised by the movie is the importance of working as a group uh, to make things change. Uh, and to find such kind of group, I had to go outside the university and I went to the civil society and I found a very good support there. And uh, we, we, I have to say that uh, we made also great uh, changes and we had an impact, which means that things are still feasible and uh, I mean, when we want, there is a, where there is a will, there is a, a way, as we say. So uh, uh, we made a change uh, at the, at the legisl legislative uh, level, uh, and the law has changed uh, for uh, elections. It's, well, it starts there. It starts somewhere. It has to start somewhere. And then it's uh, 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 coming slowly uh, from top to down to all the sectors, including education and research. So we have changed the law. And now we have the system of quota for the parliament, for election, legislative elections, municipal elections, which is a very important thing. Uh, I haven't... Uh, uh, succeeded yet to put this quota within the university at the level of the university, but uh, with uh, I think it's it, things are 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 evolving uh, slowly but surely. And I have to emphasize on the fact that we need to work as a group to make things change. Yes. Um, okay, Astrid, do you wanna? Yeah, I think this is a very good question by Gudrun. Um, I think it's also one of the most difficult uh, topics, the subtle, the subtle discrimination, um, because it's difficult to pinpoint, uh, also difficult to address with uh, with people. Um, I've I've experienced uh, examples uh, myself, for instance, when um, representatives. Uh, or a representative name needs to be proposed, for instance, related to climate change and uh, you know, climate change related research, and a name needs to be proposed from our department. And that it's always, you know, among the same names, um, things like that. And of course, you cannot, you cannot tell um, what the background is. And uh, another example is when you're in a meeting, in a management team meeting, and the point that you make is not being recognized. And then, um, you know, to, to, uh, uh, after a few minutes, another person, usually white male, uh, older generation, makes the same type of remark, and then it's fully recognized and fully confirmed by everyone. So, and this does not... Um, yeah, it's it's not single locations, but it's still difficult to pinpoint, and I have no uh, no real answer to Gudrun's question uh, uh, and, and how to tackle it and and address it. I try to speak up sometimes, not always, because easily you get labeled as as being an activist or activist type of person. Uh, but when I find the, the situation sufficiently important, then I s do speak up. For instance, with this uh, appointment of the diversity officer, I did speak up. My message re did reach the dean. And then uh, the, the simple uh, uh, remark is made, yeah, people deserve a second chance. You know, it, it, there's always excuses. So I, I don't have a real solution to this. Um, Thank you. Um, Rafael, do you want to add something to that? 
Yeah, I agree that this is a, a very difficult problem because we are dealing with the big chunk of the iceberg. So all of these that, and again, I don't like to call them microaggressions because everything can seem micro if you look from far enough, but the person in the receiving end, it doesn't feel that small. So all of these things that happen every day, that happen continuously, again, we can try to lead by example, raise awareness, but they are still embedded there on, on that culture. So small things that we can do, again, trying to do the, the extra mile, I might have a best friend colleague here, but if I'm addressing them in an email where I'm addressing other students, it's not gonna be by first name, it's gonna be by their title. And again, it might not sound normal for someone that wants to be addressed as a in a first name basis all the time, but let's try to, to generate those type of, of recognition so that, again, for someone that knows that I don't care that they call me doctor or for my, my first name, but let's make sure that people get recognized by their title. So those types of things that, again, some people might find that, yeah, I, I don't care, but it really has a toll when it happens every day on a person. So those small things, as long as we keep raising awareness, as long as we keep, again, as individuals doing that small little part that might seem not very important for some, but it's really important when we look at the, at the whole picture, at least we, we can try to, to make that, that dent on, on that iceberg. But yeah, it's just identifying all of those little things for all of those different groups. It's really hard. And trying to solve all of them, it takes a, it takes all of us. And that's why I think that having this type of inclusive events when we can reach out more people to, again, inform, there's a problem and we need to make sure that we all know it. One, maybe I can add Isabella, is that okay? Um, one important thing that I, I noticed myself is that when someone speaks up or uh, that it's important to um, and address a certain behavior, that it's important to help, to confirm, uh, because uh, it's very easy for the aggressor, uh, you know, uh, I'm not talking about the amount of aggression, but for the aggressor, it's very easy to when you speak up to direct the aggression towards the new person, it's extremely important to help and to form a group. Yeah, I totally agree on that. Uh, uh, if I may add, uh, is it okay, Astrid? Yes. Uh, I think it's a very important point here. As I said, it's a, and as Astrid said, the, the, the group if effects uh, for fighting such and uh, standing against such uh, behavior. And I will add another thing is that I, I, um, I'm not scared to be called a feminist. I am now, now known as a feminist, as a public figure of feminism. There is no problem about it. And I'm, I'm proud of it actually, because every time I go into a meeting, people start thinking, oh, so we have again, this woman who's going to talk about gender issue. And I'm very proud of it. Yes, you need to think about it. And I'm here for that. <laughs> and uh, it doesn't scare me. But the thing is, I've also, I reached this situation because I'm a little, I feel a little bit more free. Uh, when I think about my career, I reached the highest position I can reach in my uh, uh, as a professor, as a full professor, and I uh, and the least I can do is to speak loudly and speak out about all these things that women can may face, uh, and uh, it is very important. Uh, uh, what what I hate the most when. Uh, uh, when we start talking about the gender issue, and when you when you hear about a complaint about this uh, uh, the, uh, the, this approach, the gender approach, uh, you have also uh, all the time this uh, answer coming is well, it's because of the lack of competence that we don't have uh, uh, women in such position, and uh, we don't have uh, 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 at the same level of competence. We, we prefer to choose a man rather than a woman which is completely, I mean, uh, unjustified. Uh, it's not because I speak about the, the lack of opportunities that I am uh, automatically less 
uh, competence or I have less skills uh, th than a man. And this is a problem that we, a woman faces all the time in her career. She all the time needs to make her proofs that she is at the at, the, at a good level. She she can do she can perform at the same uh, level as a man. Uh, and uh, in the movie. Um, uh, Dr. Hopkins, uh, Nancy, has uh, raised a very important point. She said she spends about, about 20 hours a week uh, for, for this uh, gender issues. This is something that she could have uh, invested in her career and make more progress in her career. And for us, because the fa of the fact that we are female, we need to make progress in our, fa in our career, but at the same time, uh, give more time to, <laughs> to prove that we are, uh, we are worth this uh, importance, worth uh, what we are having. And this is not fair, but uh, it is worth to do it because we need our, it's for the, the sake of our girls, uh, our next, next generation. Uh, and if it has to take this amount of time from us, uh, then we have to do it. Yes, uh, thank you very much for your answer. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, I think it's also very important to still work on, on these issues despite taking some time off your, your actual work, so your research. Um, maybe now talking more about um, the role of uh, maybe IAHR. So during the movie, um, Dr. Willenbring, she describes to her former colleague, so to Dr. Um, Adam Lewis, um, how women sometimes experience weird situations, for instance, during conferences. And sometimes that this can then lead to people thinking that maybe some women don't deserve the position that they have. So what do you think that IHR can do to maybe create an environment at a conference, for instance, that is more inviting? Um, I mean, Rochelle Burke, she also described that it's a lot of times she feels very uncomfortable during conferences because they're not made in a way that she feels welcome because she's in, in the minority. So um, yeah, what do you think IHR, for instance, during Riverflow or the, the big IHR conference, what do you, what are, um, examples or strategies that they could do to make it maybe more inviting for, for everyone. Um, Astrid, do you want to maybe start since you've organized the, the last um, Rural Flow Conference? Um, well, one, one important suggestion is to at least have a decent number of female um, keynote speakers or a more diverse range of keynote speakers. I think in one of the last worldwide IAHR conferences, I think it was um, almost men, uh, all, all men. Um, and uh, recently with, um, there is a women's support group that really makes a point when they see an announcement of a conference like, like that with only male keynote speakers or just no diversity at all, then um, they, they contact the organizing committee. And with the last year's IAHR Riverflow meeting, um, we pulled a trick and we simply selected only female, only female keynote speakers, just to make the point um, that there's a sufficient number of, of uh, female researchers to, uh, to select from, and not just female, but diverse in, in, in a broader sense. Um, that's, that's one thing, um, but I think we need the role models. I think that's that's an uh, important. Uh, and also, when um, when we're asked for recommendations, uh, for awards, for committee members, uh, think about diversity uh, when you recommend names. Don't take always the usual suspects. Um, thank you. Um, Dalila, do you want um, yeah, to share your uh, experience also since you're a member of the IHR task, gender task force? So. That's right. And we are about, uh, we are eight uh, members of the gender, um, uh, the, the task force on strengthening gender equity within IHR. Uh, and uh, we have done uh, really good progress uh, uh, about uh, gender issues. 
And uh, I think that uh, one of the key, uh, for instance, in conferences for IHI, as uh, Astrid said, uh, yes, we need to have more women as panelists uh, in, in all sessions. Not, uh, and we, want, we don't want to have a, a special session for gender issues, no, no. We want to have it transversal in all sessions with uh, at least one woman panelist uh, uh, for, for uh, each session. Uh, I think that we need to think a little bit more about uh, uh, the presence of uh, we, women in the organizing committee or scientific committees for, for the, these conferences, uh, having uh, females in, as members of the juries for any prize uh, uh, that uh, will be organized within the, the congresses or conferences. Uh, we, we need to think about also recognizing uh, females uh, work in research. Uh, lately, we, we've done, uh, I think for the 85th anniversary, uh, we uh, published something about gender issues in hydrolink. Uh, so uh, yeah, I think that IHR is doing a, a really a good progress uh, toward the uh, gender issues. And uh, I think for the conferences, yes, it's sure that we need more panel, women panelists and more women in organizing uh, committees. Uh, uh, if I want to, to talk uh, about uh, a general level, I mean, general measures outside the IHR, uh, I think that um, at, at universities and uh, uh, higher education quota system doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't discard the competences, no. Uh, it's just it's just a way to promote more women uh, in uh, governance structures within uh, uh, within this institution, research institution, to make a uh, a systemic and uh, sustainable change within uh, within this institution. And uh, I think we need also to think about uh, some uh, cultural uh, activities and educational activities. And when I say about education, education at the level of the university, but the education also at the level of peoples and give more role models uh, for these uh, peoples to see that uh, uh, success can be success in research and education and career can be uh, a female word. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you. So Rafael, do you wanna um, add some ideas? Uh -huh. Yeah, I agree that representation matters, and I think the organizers of sessions and events at IHR are moving in that direction. I think we just need to be careful to not create a different category. And again, just as Astrid was mentioning before, with the whole idea of you were just hired because you are a diversity hire, you were just hired because you are a woman, then now it's you just got a keynote because you are a woman in this field. So we need to make sure that we normalize all of this because it's so complex that every step that we try to move forward there's always going to be some, some pushback. So we just need to be careful with how to, to navigate that as, as an institution. And also we need to have some mechanism for accountability. Again, all of those stories about misbehaving in, in conferences, again, we cannot rely on people posting their experiences on Twitter to find out that someone is doing that in, in a conference. So there has to be some mechanism so we know if, if people know that there's one person that does the same every single conference, why do we need to wait until 20 years later it comes up in the news so that we and everyone says, oh yeah, I, I knew that guy, he was doing that. And so again, some level of accountability on the institutions that it's easy to report these type of issues would go a, a long way. And yeah, just trying to make all of these events more accessible. Now, after this year, we know that some people will prefer to, to do it online. Some people rather go directly to the, to the in-person events. So let's, let's try to make it more accessible for everyone that feels comfortable in their own way on, on these conferences. Yeah, thank you very much. Those are very um, interesting additions. Um, so I'm just gonna um, continue maybe reading uh, one or two more questions, let's see, depending on the time. So um, Adina, she, she asked the question, that um, it's interesting how the professors in the film with the longest career fought for equal research resources, um, whereas younger professors now face more intersectional discrimination. So not only because of being female, but also due to their race or um, sexual orientation, for instance. 
So do you think that the challenges as female researchers are now getting more complex or in general for researchers? Um, Rafael, do you wanna um, start? Uh, I don't have enough data to, to talk about that in detail, but I think that it, it, it becomes more complex because now there's a more, di more diverse group. So as, it, as the field becomes more diverse, there are specific problems that different groups are gonna have in, in, their, in their careers. So yeah, if we talk about space, when it was a thing between white men and white, and, and white women at the beginning, and now we are seeing people of color and, and, and black women. So it comes with all of these different challenges. So it's not just that the, the field is creating those challenges, is that those embedded challenges by different groups it's just getting into now into, into academia. So it's again, very, very complex, very hard to, to address. But yeah, it, the first thing is to try to recognize that it exists and try to find out ways to address it. Um, Astrid, do you wanna add something? Um, yeah, I also find it difficult to answer whether uh, the situation is, is getting more complicated. Um, I, I, I agree that it adds to the complexity. Um, and, um, and I agree that we, yeah, we need to continue to act. There is not, there's no reason yet to, um, to relax. And uh, there's also no, um, uh, yeah, I would say we simply cannot say we do nothing and and not and decide not to go against what is happening. I, I think we need to continue to step up. But whether it's increasing with time, I I, I also don't have the data to say that. Which I think is that the film uh, really helps to provide data uh, and numbers in an accessible manner. So I think it will really contribute to the discussion based on numbers. Because people in science, of course, like numbers. And, um, and, and the numbers are very clear. So I think the film really helps in the communication. Yes, I also had the same experience. It was uh, quite interesting to see that it's all um, confirmed by, by data. Yeah. Um, Dalila, do you wanna add something? Uh, all I have to add is to say that we should not take anything for granted. I mean, no matter what we do, uh, I think as long as we stop fighting for our rights, then we will lose them. Nothing is, is guaranteed, nothing is taken for granted, especially at, uh, uh, for regarding gender issues. Uh, I, I think that the best way to to tackle this problem is to introduce uh, gender committees uh, in management structures, uh, especially to, to collect data and statistics and make periodic surveys uh, uh, and send in questionnaire to minorities, to uh, diverse uh, groups, uh, uh, to make sure that these people are really uh, I mean, uh, uh, they are really integrated and there is a full inclusion of all the diversity within all the levels of, uh, uh, of education and research career. Uh, so I, I very much recommend uh, making this kind of gender committees uh, to, to monitor how uh, this uh, diversity is included within the policies of, uh, at the level of our university. Yeah, um, thank you very much. I, yeah, I, I think it's very important what you said that it's uh, it's not an option to take this for granted and it's important to keep working on it and try to improve um, whatever um, system we're in depending on. So either a research group or if you're higher up um, an institution or organization. So unfortunately, we're already out of time. Um, there have been lots of questions that we're not, we're not able to answer. Um, so I think this demonstrates that it's a, it's a topic that um, it's very interesting for um, the IHR community. And um, 
from my perspective, it's, it's great that there's now this IHR gender task force that really highlights this topic um, and tries to improve um, the situation. So thank you very much to all the participants and especially all the panelists for, for sharing your views and, and giving some advice to the IHR community. And of course, thank you to the IHR for um, supporting this coffee chat and also to um, Ansa and Theo for organizing this. Um, so I think now we're at the end of this coffee chat. Um, a happy International Women in Engineering Day again. And I hope to see you again to the uh, fourth coffee chat that will be announced um, in some months. So thank you, Isabella. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for hosting. Sure. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.